Russ's talk today is uh, Emerald Ash Borer Biological Control. So welcome, Russ. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, you're good. You're okay. a little faint though. All right, I'll speak up then. Um, so I'll go through this quickly, uh, then have plenty of time for questions afterwards, hopefully. So my program, one of the main programs that I have is Emerald Ash Borer. Um, biological control. We're doing the management, We've moved away from eradication. Um, I'm going to go through quickly, hopefully this will work. Um, the main thing that we want to do is maintain ash as a viable part of the American landscape. And there's a lot of people that have done this over time, including APHIS folks, um, but also ARS, uh, which is Agricultural Research Service. Um, this is the bug, and this is what the landscape can look like sometimes. Uh, in a lot of areas, we're going through um, some regeneration, and, and those are the areas where the biological control really works well. We're not going to save the big trees with biological control. Um, those are, but we are going to potentially help with the regeneration. This is where it first started. It was first found in Michigan in 2002. This is the progression. That's 2005. 2006, seven, eight. And the, the quarantine area is in yellow and the new uh, counties are in, um, are in red. It's 2016, 17, 18. And in 19, we just show the new counties. The quarantine areas are still, the previous detections are in yellow, but the new counties are in red. So in 2019 and in 2020, we've had some new counties as well. These are mainly fill-ins. You know, we've got one up here in Massachusetts, a couple in Iowa, um, Minnesota. Um, and we also are probably going to have another one here in, in South Dakota. Um, so currently, 35 states in the District of Columbia are infested with EAB and are regulated. Um, we have over 11, 1,100 infested counties, more than 876,000 square miles are currently regulated and it's 28% of the contiguous um, uh, lower 48. It's the largest regulated area that we have uh, in PPQ. So it's a lot of territory. Um, this is a, a kind of a timeline. The first detection was in 2002. We then began visual survey uh, and, and a search for biological control agents. Uh, we the, used a girdled tree survey, which was very good, and then we got purple traps. The first biological control releases were in 2008. We opened up a rearing facility in Brighton, Michigan, um, which is the heart of the, of the infested area, of, in the original infested area, in 2009. And we developed contiguous quarantine areas that that large uh, section was done in 2012 and at the same time our funding decreased um, from 35 you know between 40 and 35 million per year down to less than 10 million per year we currently are about at um, at six and a half million per year by by 2015 we had re released more than a million uh, of these stingless wasps that are the parasitoids for emerald ash borer. We began a national survey, um, a contracted national survey in 2016, which ended in 2018. Um, and to date, uh, more than 7.5 million wasps have been released. We release anywhere from 600,000 to 800,000 parasitoids per year. So this is our our funding situation, and as you can see, a large drop. We're now down at 6.6 .6 million. The, the parasitoids are, are Tetrasticus plenipanesi, which is a larval parasitoid, uh, two Spathius species, Spathius galini and Spathius agrilli, which again are both uh, larval parasitoids, and Oobius agrilli, which is a um, egg parasitoid. These are all highly specific and only attack um, bupre buprestids, um, and they really only attack uh, the emerald ash borer because that's their food source. And they, these are all reared in our Brighton rearing facility, which is a complex 
way to, to grow things because we not only have to grow these four parasitoids, we also have to grow healthy emerald ash borers so that they can feed on. So there are five different bugs that are, that are grown in the facility and we actually have to cut down wood, transport it to, uh, cut down infested trees and transport it to uh, Brighton and, and then rear out the EAB and then you know, work, do their magic to get the parasitoids going. These are what they look like. Uh, this is Tetrasticus, uh, Tets for short. Uh, this is um, Spathius agrilli. The Galini was, came on later, um, but it's used more in the northern air, tier states. Um, and this is Oobius. Oobius is a very small um, parasitoid. This is the, an egg, the edge of an EAB egg, which are, are basically the size of a pinhead. Um, and that's about how big they are. They're, they're about the size of the egg, so they're tiny, tiny little bugs. So the real experts are the ones that made the, the guidelines, which this is a page, this is the front page of the Emerald Ash Borer Biological Control Release Guidelines. And you see down here is the, is the web link for that. And uh, that is uh, where our most up-to-date information is, is that EAB field release guidelines, biological control release. The ones who, who did this is Julie Gould, um, who is an entomologist and uh, at our Otis laboratory, our science and technology laboratory within PPQ. Uh, and Teresa Murphy is the technician that helped. Does, she does a lot of work with that. Leah Bauer is, is currently retired, um, but she did a lot of work on the guidelines and did a lot of work on the biocontrol of, of EAB and Toby uh, Patrice as well with the Forest Service. Jean Duan is a research entomologist in Delaware with the USDA ARS, animal, or I'm sorry, uh, Agricultural Research Service. Um, his facility is a containment facility and that's where all of the uh, target and non-target tests are done on our biological control organisms. Um, and then they determine if, if it's that can be eligible for release. Uh, they currently have another um, egg parasitoid that they're evaluating now. All of this has to go through, um, these stingless wasps are all uh, put through a rigorous testing so that we're, we're sure that we're not gonna be releasing something that's gonna attack native bugs. Um, ben Slager is the, uh, is the entomologist uh, at our Brighton facility. And, you know, they're the ones that actually make the uh, parasitoids and send them out for release. These are the, the four parasitoids again. These stingless wasps um, are what we, uh, we release. And these are the how many we've released by species. You see the Tetrasticus plenipanesi is the one that, that is the most. Here we, in 2015, we released over 900,000 of those. Uh, we typically release between 600,000 and 800,000 parasitoids per year. And we've released more than 7 million, 7.5 million parasitoids to date. The, we've released, uh, as of last year, we have um, two new states that we've released in a total of 28 um, states in the District of Columbia and two Canadian provinces. We have two new states we've released in Maine and Nebraska, total of uh, 200 sites last year. Uh, we're, we're gearing up for probably about the same. We are, there have been some challenges with the social distancing, um, but what they've done is they've basically created two crews, one for, are on for two and a half days and, and the other set is on for two and a half days. So they can maintain social distancing in that manner. Last year we released in, in 67 new counties um, and we've released so far in a total of over 300 infested counties. There's 1176 infested counties as you saw earlier so you know we're, we still have a ways to go. Uh, this is the release of, uh, of Tetrasticus. Uh, uh, these are the release sites in the different provinces and uh, that we've done in recoveries. So we got, we show how the recoveries are in the black dots and the uh, releases are, the counties where the releases are occurring are in yellow. 
Uh, so Tetraskis planipanisi has been recovered from 12 states. You can see uh, where they've been released here in, in blue and the recoveries in yellow. So this is the 40th parallel here. One thing that's important with Tetrasticus, um, especially, is that it has two seasons, two generations per year. The first generation comes out before uh, hatching, uh, before emergence of EAB. And they require larvae that are in the third or fourth instar. So if the overwintering of, if you have a two year life cycle for EAB, then um, you, you're gonna have larvae that are available for them to be tetrasticus to infest, infect or to attack, parasitize. If you do not, then um, it's, it's difficult, it, it's impossible really for the, the establishment to occur is what we think. Um, and what we're seeing is that the 40th parallel is a pretty good match. We also have a good model, um, which uh, tells us exactly how, you know, what the likelihood of percentage of EAB uh, overwintering as larvae is in those areas. So recovery in 12 states, recovery of oobius, uh, uh, grilli in nine states. Um, we've released in 28 states uh, and we've, uh, we are targeting those states where we haven't seen recovery yet. Those are one of the things that are being targeted. Um, I know that one of the questions I'll probably get is about deregulation. I haven't talked at all about deregulation because right now we're still responding to comments and, and that's something that's gonna, gonna come up. Uh, but even with deregulation, we're not gonna be, this program's not gonna go away. Uh, we're still gonna be doing the biocontrol releases. We're still gonna be helping states do um, kiln certifications uh, by you know, helping state personnel and training state personnel and allowing the use of our kiln probes and, and everything like that. So, uh, but yeah, we are targeting uh, states where we haven't seen recoveries yet. That's another thing that we're gonna be doing too, is looking at how, whether or not it's established. So there's a, timing for releases is very important. As I've said, um, you can contact the eab.biocontrol.program at usda.gov. Also, there's a new report.eab at usda.gov. That's something where if, uh, if the public thinks they, they have uh, emerald ash borer, they can report it themselves. We've had a number of reports in, um, in states that are positive, and some of them from New York. Um, so that's report.eab at usda.gov. It's not on here anywhere, but uh, so spring releases of Tetrasticus can occur uh, in areas above the 40th parallel. Um, Oobius, we mainly do summer releases and uh, late summer releases of, uh, of some of the larval, larval parasitoids for Tetrasticus and Agrilli. Um, we're, right now we're looking at, because there's a lot, a lot of the work has been done in the northern states on emerald ash borer and biological control of emerald ash borer. We're currently working with some southern states to look at the, the phenology of emerald ash borer and to determine how best to, to get to the, uh, to get the biocontrol out at times. So this is, this shows where the degree day activity is. Um, this one is from last year and in uh, May of last year shows that the EAB emergence is gonna be occurring right along in here in May of last year and up in the mountains. And, and your peak activity would be in this area um, with the, between 1100 and 1400 degree days. Where there's a number of spring releases uh, of Oobius and uh, Tetrasticus and Spathius grilli and Spathius galini. Uh, again, we're evaluating the, the parasitoid establishment. Uh, this is the yellow pan traps um, that, are, that are utilized for that. And really all of the information that we have is in this field release um, guidelines. And that is available online um, and it is uh, changed every year. But this is a dynamic link, so that's where it'll be. Talks about entering the recovery data and what's needed. Uh, MapBioControl.org is is where we do all of our. We have all of our um, 
information is stored there. Uh, we have dynamic links to that and pull it in to our system every uh, on a weekly basis. And I'll be glad to answer any questions now. I hope I stayed within my time frame. Yes, you 